Let's sing for the feast. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord, save thy people and bless thine inheritance, granting to thy people victory over all their enemies. And by the power of thy cross, preserving thy commonwealth. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us. Amen. Amen. Okay, this is going to be the first of what is, I'm planning on being uh, eight different classes, each dedicated to a different American saint. Um, I finally got around to doing a little flyer and posted them on the doors. So if you want to see which saint is when, you can look at that. But tonight we're going to do and uh, look at St. Herman of Alaska. A little introduction to this series. Um, as you've heard, heard me say before, and talk about the importance of reading the lives of the saints. Um, the lives of the saints are a living gospel. Through them, we can see how the gospel, go, gospel can be lived in, in various times, places, and circumstances. And it helps us better to understand our own situation um, and how to approach you know, similar circumstances as the saints and with the same spirit, maybe not the same exact Response, but the same spirit. Um, going a little bit deeper, it's even more important to know not only the lives of saints, but the lives of the saints of our own time. Because they are engaged with their particular struggles and troubles and temptations um, that we are, or at least more closely to the maybe a third century saint. And then going a little bit deeper, um, it's, important, it's important to know the lives of the saints of our own time, but also in our own time and, and our own place, where we are, because it makes, it brings it even more home to us. So it's not even our own, not just our own time uh, period, but um, the places where we walk, they've walked. Um, and it, it just um, more solidifies the, f the fact within us of how to live as a Christian in our own day and age. It's also interesting because if you look at the saints of America, um, America is so young that even... Um, with St. Herman of Alaska, for instance, or maybe the earlier American saints we'll look at, it's only a couple hundred years. So, I mean, with Alaska, I mean, there's not going to be a lot, a lot that's changed. You know, if you went up to Alaska right now, compared to when St. Herman was there, you know, there's going to be some modern amenities and things, but there's still going to be the Aleut villages that were there. You know, there's still um, a lot of the same things. So even, um, you know, our saints, because our country is so young, um, become even more relative to us. It's not like Greece where you have, you know, 2,000 years of history and, you know, you have <coughs> saints from every century, you know, to know. <laughs> and lastly... Um, it's important to know the lives of the saints of your place and time um, because to know is to love. So just like you read the Bible because you love God and you want to know more about him and therefore by learning more about him you come to love him more or you know, going to the services or you know, doing your prayers or whatever it is. Um, the more we know our saints, the more we learn to love them and um, be encouraged by them. Um, but also we learn what it is to appreciate and love our own country more because they loved the place where they were, which is why 
they struggled in the way they did, especially, you know, St. Herman, who we're going to look at tonight, who was a missionary. Um, he brought the gospel here, and he loved the people here, you know. And by learning the lives of the saints of America um, in particular, or the saints of you know, your own location, your own country, um, we can learn to love our own country more. So all that being said, um, you know, this is why I've wanted to do this class um, and to present to you the lives of you know, eight saints. There's, there are more. Um, thank God. Um, but I wasn't going to, you know, take it into next year. Um, so having introduced the class, let's talk about St. Herman. St. Herman is the oldest of our saints. He was born the earliest. Um, he was also the first missionary of the, he was a part of the first missionary group that came to America, or the Americas. Um, when we look at his life in a few different sections, his early life, his entrance into monasticism, his missionary activity, and then his life on Spruce Island where he ended his life. So let's look at his early life to begin with. Um, unfortunately, not a lot of information is known about his early life. It's, it happens with a number of our saints because you don't know a person's going to be a saint, so you don't keep a lot of records <laughs> from their kids or, you know, a uh, teenager or whatever. But we do know that he was born in 1751 in Voronezh, Russia, to a pious peasant family. Um, at his birth, he was given the name Yegor Ivanovich Popov. Um, so that was his baptismal name, Yegor. Um, as he was growing up, he took on the piety of his parents, as is the case with a lot of the lives of our saints. The, the parents were pious, they were devout, and they gave that inheritance of piety to their children. Um, if we want to raise up saints, we need to, you know, at least be pious. We want to be saints ourselves. But we, we have to love um, God. We have to love his church. We have to love the spiritual life. And uh, the young uh, St. Herman learned those things from his parents. He uh, made several pilgrimages in his youth to the famous Sarav Monastery. Um, during this pilgrimage, he made the acquaintance of the elder Varlam of Sarav, and he would stay with him on a couple of occasions. Father Theophan, who doesn't say who exactly he, he was, uh, who knew Father Herman at some point in his life, he recounts this story of when um, St. Herman stayed with Elder Varlam one time. He said, Father Herman, he is now in America. At a young age, lived in the wilderness with Father Varlam. Father Varlam once departed for a short time, leaving the youngster. He was 12 years old, alone. It happened that some people gathering mushrooms in the forest became lost and came across the cell of the d desert dwellers. When Yegor em emerged to meet them, they were frightened by him. So unusual did his presence in the forest seem to them. <laughs> Now skipping ahead um, a few years, at 17 he was conscripted into the military, as is very common um, still throughout the world. You have a you know mandatory you know few years of military service, um, which we don't have in this country. So you know, for better or worse, sometimes. Um, but during his service, which not. A lot is known about his time in the military, but he did serve. We did know that he served as an assistant clerk in Kadam or Kadam. Um, and during this time as a clerk, uh, he learned how to write uh, much more eloquently, which served him later in life um, when he would write letters back to Russia or um, you know to various people when he was in Alaska. And in 1777. 
at 26 years of age, he was released from the military um, due to illness. And I want to read um, about this miraculous healing that he experienced in his youth. So this was uh, sometime before, I think, he went, entered the military. Um, it says, during Yegor's youth, the following incident occurred. On the right side of his neck, under his beard, there appeared an abscess. The pain was horrible. The swelling grew rapidly and disfigured his whole face. It was very difficult to swallow, and there was an intolerable smell. In such a dangerous condition, expecting to die, Yegor did not turn to an earthly physician. But with warm prayer and tears, he fell before the icon of the heavenly queen, entreating healing from her. He prayed the whole night. Then, with a wet towel, he wiped the face of the icon of the most pure Theotokos, and with this towel, he wrapped his swelling. Continuing to pray with tears, he fell asleep on the floor in exhaustion and saw in a dream that he had been healed by the Most Holy Virgin. In the morning, he awoke, stood up, and to his great amazement, found himself completely healthy. The swelling had disappeared without rupturing, leaving only a small lump as a reminder of the miracle. The doctors who were told about this healing did not believe it, insisting that the abscess <coughs> must have burst by itself or must have been cut out. However, the words of the physicians were the words of the experience of human weakness, for where God's grace acts, the order of nature is overcome. So from his early years, not only did he um, learn piety from his parents and from the elder Varlam, but he had personal spiritual experience um, as seen um, you know, as the pinnacle of that was this healing um, from the mother of God. And so after he was um, released from the military service, he entered into his monastic life. And he was accepted as a novice in the same year at the Sarav Monastery. Incidentally, Prokhor Moshnin, the future Saint Seraphim of Sarav, also began as a novice in Sarav the same year. So during this time, until 1982, um, the famous Valam Monastery had been in a horrible state of decline. And to top it all off, in the fall of 1781, three of the four inhabitants of the monastery drowned while crossing Lake Ladoga, which the monastery sits on. And a few months later, in January 1782, the abbot, the father of Rem, was relieved of his duty and reposed only two months later in March. So the monastery was left completely empty in a you know, state of decline. And to, to fill the superior's vacancy and to start building up again this famous and uh, glorious monastery, Valam, the Metropolitan Gabriel of Novgorod and St. Petersburg assigned the hieromonk Father Nazarius of Sarov as the new superior of Valam. And with him, Father Nazarius took four novices to begin to the process of rebuilding the monastery, one of whom was the future Father Herman. And on November 1st, 1782, two of the novices, Igor and another, were tortured into the monastic life, and it's at this time that he received the name of Herman. Um, as you know, or maybe you don't know, maybe you kind of know, at the monastic tonsure of a person, you receive a new name. So um, it's cutting off uh, the old man, it's... Um, no longer being attached to who you were in the world, um, and you become a new person. Um, sometimes this also happens at ordinations. A priest will receive a new name, but definitely at the monastic tonsure, you get a new name. A lot of times, it'll start with the same letter as your you know, um, baptismal name or your uh, previous name started with. Um, also should be known that Herman is just a bad translation. His name wasn't actually Herman, but that's how we know him. Um, his name was actually Germanus, Germanos. Um, so, but we've come, we received it as Herman, and now it's Herman. So, Father Herman would uh, often remember 
with fondness, his time in Valam, even naming where he lived on Spruce Island, um, New Valam. I want to read for you a remembrance of Father Herman's time at Valam. So the future abbot of Valam after Nazarius, Father Varlam, was recounting Father Herman's time. He says, Father Herman went through various obediences And as being ready for any good thing, he was, among other things, sent to the city of Seredable in order to supervise the marble quarry there. The brethren loved Father Herman and would impatiently await his return from Seredable to the monastery. Having tested the zeal of the ascetic, the wise elder, Father Nazarius, let him go and live in seclusion. His hermitage was located in a dense forest, about a mile's distance from the monastery. There is now a cultivated field on the site, which has retained the name of Germanova Pulyi, Herman's Field. On feast days, Father Herman would come from his hermitage to the monastery. It would happen that during Compline, standing in the Kleros, he would sing in a pleasant tenor voice the refrains of the canon, Sweetest Jesus, save us sinners, and Most Holy Theotoko, save us. And tears like hail would pour from his eyes. So it gives us a little glimpse into his life. Um, his monastic life at Valam um, says he was tested as um, monks are through obediences, um, but also um, through other ways by the abbot. And then he was allowed to go live um, on his own in a small hermitage near the monastery, but outside the monastery's actual walls with for greater solitude and um, quiet. It's during the second half of the 18th century, Russia's boundaries were enlarging. Um, it's during this period the Aleutian Islands were discovered. And with this discovery, the desire was born in the church to bring the gospel to and enlighten the inhabitants of the islands. Um, don't let uh, people accuse us of not being mission minded even if we're very lame in it nowadays, um, or not evangelical, um, because it was the church throughout history who sent the missionaries into places. So you have great missionaries um, like St. Methodius and uh, Cyril, the brothers um, We have St. Herman and uh, the monks from Russia who were sent to Alaska. Um, Mission work is the church's work. Um, And we need to do more to, you know, revive that work, really, in our own day and age. Um, Obviously, we can do and should do, you know, mission work here. Um, But... We're also not, I'm sure, some of us, maybe not in this room, some of us in this country at least, are called somewhere else. You know, it takes a special charisma, but we can, with God's help, um, you know, continue the mission life of the church outside of our own country, like Father Herman. And so with this desire, the Holy Synod of Russia blessed a mission to Alaska with men selected from the Valam and Konovitz monasteries. And for this initial mission, 10 men were chosen, 10 monks. Um, Some ordained, some not ordained, Um, but they're all monastics. And they left Valam for Kodiak, Alaska in 1794. Missionaries began this new mission with zeal, and they saw very uh, early success with several thousands accepting the faith. Um, they were able to build a school in Kodiak, build a church. They built um, a monastery for the members of the mission because they're all monks. They all live together. Um, but that success, that early success, was not going to last for long. And uh, 
at least not in the same force, with the same force. Um, the monks, on the one hand, uh, they were being persecuted by the head of the Russian-American training company um, because the monks would defend the locals because they were the locals themselves were persecuted and treated very poorly by the trading company. And the trading company did not like that the monks were there, you know, standing in defense of, you know, the people who they thought they were better than, who they could do whatever to they wanted. You know? uh, so that, on the one hand, um, limited their success over time. And on the other, <coughs> um, Everyone died except for Father Herman, basically. So after about five years, a um, number of the original group died in a shipwreck, drowned, um, as they had traveled back to Russia, and they were coming back from that trip. And um, during that uh, uh, trip, uh, when they were on the sea, they shipwrecked and drowned. Um, and not long after that, you know, um, also St. Juvenali was martyred at this time. Um, and there's only a couple left and they soon died as well and left Father Herman all by himself. So, um, I'm not sure exactly, uh, what the time period is between everyone dying, but, um, it seems like with it was, you know, like within five five to ten years. Um, so then, after everyone had uh, moved on to the next life, he left Kodiak and went to Spruce Island. Spruce Island is connect or is uh, an island off the coast of Kodiak that's separated from Kodiak from about a mile wide straight. Um, And when he moved to Spruce Island, he originally dug and lived in a hole. Um, but eventually, apparently, um, you know, feelings had you know, improved a little bit at least because the trading company um, built a cell for him to live in. And from that point, once that cell was built, um, he lived in that for the rest of his life. But when he first moved there, he just dug a hole and lived in that. Um, he eventually built a chapel near the cell and a small wooden house um, for a school. And he planted a garden. He lived, you know, off the land. He labored, you know, did all the work himself. Um, there's one um, story related about his life where his disciple saw him at night because he was always working. Um, another um, uh, characteristic of saints that we see they're all, you know they're always working they're always doing something um but father herman saint herman is um at night he was moving a log but the the the, the disciple recounts that the log was four times you know, or, or or normally the law that size the law start over <laughs> okay so he was moving carrying a log moving the logs from wherever to wherever and the disciples said that the log was so large that it should have taken four grown men to actually carry it. But, uh, you know, as we also see in the lives of saints, um, you know, things uh, don't always um, go like we would expect, you know, with our worldly minds. Um, so he was always working. He was a very simple monk. He would always wear the same clothing year round. Um, he wouldn't change his clothing or, you know, his cassock, you know, whether it was hot or cold. He was always, always wore the same one. In fact, he wore, um, for about, I think, eight years, he wore the same sheet, deerskin uh, shirt um, until he couldn't wear it anymore, um, never changing it or anything. Uh, he slept on a uh, small bench, you know, that fit, barely fit him, um, with some deer skins as his padding 
um, and two bricks that were kept under the deer skin so they couldn't actually, nobody could see, you know, his pillows with bricks. Um, it's another common thread in the lives of saints. They don't try to show their asceticism or their, you know, spiritual struggle. And as we're getting the picture of all this, we see that he was a great ascetic. Um, he hardly ate anything. He didn't sleep that often. Um, he was constantly laboring outdoors. Um, and on top of all this, he also wore um, a 15-pound uh, chain with a cross um, under everything um, as a uh, additional ascetic practice. Um, and this cross that he wore, along with his monastic hat and uh, his hand cross, all can be venerated at the Resurrection Church in Kodiak. If you go visit it, you can um, venerate uh, his relics and also these items. Um, so he was a great ascetic. He didn't care about himself or his body. Um, and he didn't... Part of his asceticism was being a great defender of the locals who lived there. He interceded for transgressors of the law. He defended those who were wronged. He helped the needy um, in whatever way he could. And the Aleuts, the locals there, would often visit him, um, either for spiritual or material needs. And whatever he could do, <coughs> he would do. Um, In 1819, an infectious disease was brought on a ship from the U.S. Um, many in Kodiak and on Spruce Island um, died. And those that the disease killed, whatever it was, um, would kill people once you got it in three days. And so um, there was often during this period uh, that... There was nobody to bury the bodies because other people were sick, you know, and everyone's getting sick. And so there was just dead bodies, you know, in the houses or, you know, wherever they, you know, died. Um, the worst part of this epidemic lasted for about a month and then it sl slowly started to decline. But during this whole time, Father Herman didn't think of himself. He didn't, you know, spare himself, go into his cell and not come out for a month. But rather, he went and visited the sick. He encouraged them to be patient, to pray, um, to repent, and to prepare for death for those who were going to die. So, um, he is an ascetic personally and ascetic on behalf of others. <coughs> he uh, sought God above all else. Um, God... Uh, he sought God by his self-denial, um, especially, whether that's his personal spiritual practices or um, his help for uh, the Aleutians there. One of his most uh, important um, missions that was to take the care of the children and teaching children. Um, it's the, not only the spiritual life, but, you know, just basic catechism, you know, the law of God um, and the faith. But he would also teach them the church services, church services and how to read in church and, you know, what to read, these kinds of things. Um, And he would gather all the children and the young adults on Sundays and feast days into his chapel and give them instructions based on, you know, on whatever the feast or, you know, the readings were that day. Um, I want to relate to you um, to give you a sense of what these talks were kind of like and how at least um, change one person's life. Um, one of his disciples' lives. He says, I was thirsty, this disciple. Oh, I was not thirsty. He was thirsty, but it says I was 30. 
I was 30 years old when I met Father Herman. It must be said that I was an educated I was educated in Naval Academy, knew many sciences, and had read much. But unfortunately, the science of sciences, the law of God, I understood superficially, and even that theoretically not applying it to my life. And I was a Christian in name only. Well, in my soul and my actions, I was a free thinker, a deist. Moreover, I did not accept the divinity and holiness of our religion. And I had only read... And I had read many atheistic works of Voltaire and other philosophers of the 18th century. Father Herman noticed this at once and desired to convert me. To my great amazement, he spoke so powerfully and intelligently and argued so convincingly that it now seems to me that no education and earthly wisdom could withstand his words. We conversed with him every day until... Until, and sometimes later than midnight, about the love of God, about eternity, about the salvation of the soul, and about Christian life. Sweet speech poured from his lips in an unceasing stream. Through such continual conversations, and by the prayers of the Holy Elder, the Lord completely converted me to the path of truth, and I became a true Christian. For all this, I am indebted to Father Herman. He is my true benefactor. So from this short recollection... We can kind of get an idea of how he spoke, just powerfully and intelligently, um, which is very surprising, Coming, figuring that he came from a peasant family, that he was so knowledgeable, but obviously part of his military, time in the military helped him. Um, but uh, I think besides that, it was not only... Um, you know, his little time in the military, but also, you know, his actually living the spiritual life and being illumined by the Holy Spirit. Our Lord tells us not to uh, worry about what to say um, when we're brought before people to give an account of our faith, because in that moment, the Holy Spirit will give us the word to say. Um, and I think this is more than anything else um, how St. Thurman could speak to the hearts of people, especially this disciple who's talking, um, who's relating all this. There once was a great storm, maybe you've heard this story, which caused a tidal wave that threatened the island. Um, by Father Herman's prayers and with the protection of the Theotokos, the island was saved from destruction. What Father Herman did was he took an icon of the Theotokos, he walked out to the beach, stuck it in the sand, and uh, stood there praying for protection of the island. He told those who were afraid, don't be afraid. The water will not go further than the spot where the icon is standing. And it turned out just as he said. Another time a fire broke out on the island, and he, with his disciple Ignatius, made a clearing of two feet wide in the forest, uh, in the path of the fire. So the fire is coming. They go down. They start clearing, making a clearing of about two feet wide so that the fire won't continue, but it'll stop. Um, but, you know, two feet wasn't this big. Um, and uh, so they did that for however long they did it. Um, and Father Herman told Ignatius, be at peace, the fire will not cross this line. And after um, they went to sleep that night, and they came back the next day to look to see what had happened, the fire came right up to the clearing, but didn't cross over it. As Father Herman began to approach his death, he made a number of prophecies that would happen after he reposed. One was that a plague that would kill many a uh, plague would come that would kill many, but also it would unite the Russians, the Aleuts of the area. And six months after his repose, the smallpox ec- epidemic hit the area. Um, it caused the local authorities to bring um, those who were unaffected or those who had survived um, from the Aleut villages, which were about 20 in the area. They brought them closer into um, Kodiak. Um, and united them more closely in this more seven villages. That was one of the prophecies he um, 
gave. The second is uh, that he would not be forgotten and that Spruce Island would not be abandoned, that uh, someone else would come after him and live like him, which did happen. Um, also, we're talking about him tonight. He has not been forgotten, um, nor was he forgotten by the people who knew him then. And uh, a third of a, uh, the th- a third prophecy he gave was that when he died, people on the mainland would not be able to see him. So those in Kodiak would not be able to see him, nor would a priest be able to bury him. He also told them um, that when he died, he didn't want anyone, um, any of the authorities to be told in Kodiak. He just wanted to be buried right there on Spruce Island and be done with it. Um, because no one's going to become anyways. <laughs> um, but the people on Spruce Island, once he did die, once he um, fell asleep in the Lord, they did end up telling the authorities in Kodiak. And what happened was that there was a month-long storm that prevented anyone from coming to the island because the uh, manager of the colonies there said, I don't want you to bury him until... I can come there and bury him and bring a proper coffin and all these kinds of things. And uh, for the next month, there was a storm that prevented anyone to come. So they waited for him to come. They didn't bury St. Herman. Um, during that whole time, his face didn't change. His body didn't give, give off any odor or anything. He just laid there. Eventually, they buried him because they realized no one's coming. <laughs> but during that whole entire time, you know, he was just... You know, as he was, as, as if just he was sleeping. For the entirety of his life, he refused ordination to the priesthood and preferred to remain a simple monk. It was really interesting because he could have done, you know, a lot more if he was a priest. You know, he could have baptized could have done the services, you know, the liturgy for the people, married them, all these things. But he chose to be a simple monk. And yet, you know, with even not being able to do the sacraments or the services in a priestly way, he affected, you know, everyone. And he reposed on November 15th, 1836. There, uh, originally... It was thought that he proposed on December 13th. So, um, but that was because they didn't realize that was just when he was entered into the registry that he had reposed. Um, and they didn't know the full story about the storm and all that. Um, so they realized he actually was actually reposed on November 15th. And then it was recorded December 13th. And so originally his feast day was December 13th. But now it's also December 13th, but we, it's also November 15th. <laughs> um, they kept it December 13th because it was, you know, kind of the uh, original date that they um, went with. Kind of like we just kept Herman as his name. <laughs> um, but he also has a, a feast, a summer feast in July, July 27th, which... I'm not sure what that feast is dedicated to. Maybe um, transfer of his relics or something. Um, So I want to offer you two um, selections from his teachings. One from a uh, a recollection of a story of someone he had a conversation with. And the other is from one of his letters. To kind of give you a flavor of what he thought about and, uh, you know, how he would speak to people and teach people. So, let's see. So, here, he was invited to speak um, with uh, a captain from St. P- Petersburg, St. Petersburg. Um, and when he went, you know, there was a, a captain and a group of, uh, of his uh, men there. And they had our, had our conversation. This is what the captain says about it. The captain himself related, we were at a loss how to answer.
like fools before him. Father posed, Father Herman posed one common question to all of them. What do you gentlemen love more than anything else? And what would each of you wish for your happiness? Various responses began to pour out. Some wished for riches, others glory, others a beautiful wife, others a beautiful ship that he would command, and so on in the same vein. Isn't it true, said Father Herman to them, that all your various wishes could be summed up in one, that each of you wishes that which, according to his understanding, he considers the best and most worthy of love? Yes, that's true, they all replied. Tell me, he continued, what could be better, higher than all, more superlative and most worthy of love, if not the Lord, our Jesus Christ himself? who created us, adorned us with good, such good qualities, gave life to all, maintains and nourishes everything, loves everyone, who is himself love and is more wonderful than all people. Shouldn't one therefore love God far more than all things and desire and seek him more than anything? All began to speak. Well, yes, that is self-evident. That is true in itself. Do you love God? The elder then asked, all replied, of course we love God. How can one not love God? And the elder replied, And I, a sinner, have been trying to love God for more than forty years and cannot say that I perfectly love him. And he began to demonstrate how one must love God. If we love someone, he says, we always remember him and try to please him. Day and night our heart is occupied with that object. Is that how you gentlemen love God? Do you often turn to him? Do you always remember him? Do you always pray to him and to fulfill his holy commandments? And they had to admit that they did not. For our good, for our happiness, concluded the elder, at least let us make a vow that from this day, from this hour, from this minute, we shall strive to love God above all else and to fulfill his holy will. What a wise and wonderful talk Father Herman conducted in society. Without a doubt, this conversation must have been impressed in the hearts of his listeners for the rest of their lives. We see such a preoccupation with the things above in this uh, short um, snippet of the conversation. How he directed his listeners from this earth, you know, eventually you're talking about riches and ships and wives and then taking them all the way to heaven, talking about how God is that first love that we have to have before all other loves. You know, like I said, I want to read for you um, portions of a letter that he wrote. He says, a true Christian is made so by faith and love toward Christ. Our sins do not in the least hinder our Christianity. According to the words of the Savior himself, he deigned to say, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to salvation. There is more joy in heaven over one who repents than over 99 righteous ones. Likewise, concerning the sinful woman who touched his feet, he deigned to say to Simon the Pharisee, to one who has love, a great debt is forgiven, but from one who has no love, even a small debt will be required. From these considerations, a Christian should bring himself to hope and joy and pay not the least attention to despair that is afflicted on one. Here one needs the shield of faith. Sin, to one who loves God, is nothing other than an arrow from the enemy in battle. A true Christian is a warrior fighting his way through the regiments of the unseen enemy to his heavenly homeland. According to the words of the apostle, our homeland is in heaven. About warriors, he says, our warfare is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. The vain desires of this world separate us from our homeland. Love for them and habit clothe our soul, as it were, in a hideous garment. This is called by the apostles the outward man. We, traveling on the journey of this life and calling upon God to help us, must divest ourselves of this hideous and hideousness and clothe ourselves in new desires, in a new love of the age to come, and thereby receive knowledge of how near or how far we are from our heavenly homeland. But it is not possible to do this quickly, 
Rather, one must follow the example of sick people who, wishing the desired health, do not leave off seeking means to cure themselves. Once again, we see his great emphasis, not on this life, but on the next, on the heaven, and on the Lord, and moving on from earthly things and going to heavenly things. Um, we can say that Father Herman was very heavenly minded. So much so, let me see if I can find it. I forgot to mark it. Um, hmm, here it is. Um, in his own words, writing to uh, his elder. who asked him, how do you, Father Herman, live alone in the forest? How do you keep from being bored? He responded, no, I'm not here, al here uh, I'm not alone there. God is there as God is everywhere. Holy angels are there. Can one be bored with him? With whom is it better and more pleasant to converse? With people or with angels? With angels, of course. He was a very singularly minded person. And in that extreme focus on loving God and becoming more like God. He loved others as we should. And so he so affected the people of Spruce Island and Kodiak that today there, as we know, there's a great Orthodox presence in Alaska from that first mission journey. Um, we cannot love others as we should. If we're not first loving God as we should. So um, I want to read for you his Apolitikion, his main, the main hymn. Um, Blessed ascetic of the northern wilds, and gracious intercessor for the whole world, teacher of the Orthodox faith and good instructor of piety, adornment of Alaska and joy of all America, Holy Father Herman, pray to Christ God that he may save our souls. So, I would uh, thought about singing it for you, um, as they do at St. Herman Monastery in Platina, California, but I chose not to. <laughs> Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to finish with his own words that we just heard from his conversation with that captain. For our good and for our happiness, let us all make a vow, at least from this day, this hour, this very minute, that we should strive to love God above all else and to do his will. Amen. <laughs>